I am the philosophical bachelor and today, I want to ask, why is there something rather than nothing? To have nothing seems simpler and more basic. For there to be something is hence puzzling. Yet our reality seems to be filled with things. To tackle this fundamental question in metaphysics, computer scientist Jason K. Resch synthesizes contemporary scientific findings and theories with philosophy. These scientific findings seem to bear out older philosophical theories. To ask why there is something rather than nothing is to seek the ultimate cause of things. To try to understand the ultimate cause is important since how can we know why something is, or should be, a certain way if we don't know why there is anything at all, asks philosopher Robert Nozick. We begin by exploring the concept of nothing. For something to come from nothing requires a first cause. Such a first cause must itself be causeless and necessary. Logical laws are causeless and necessary even in a state of nothingness. They give rise to mathematical truths. Both logic and mathematics are objective and do not depend on the existence of material things including human consciousness. If mathematics is the first cause, then mathematical truth needs to be able to generate conscious beings, after which these conscious beings or minds need to generate matter or the material world. From the abstract must come the concrete. Resch's metaphysical theory explains how things exist because necessity requires logical laws, logical laws imply incontrovertible truth, such truth includes mathematical truth, mathematical truth defines numbers, numbers possess number relations, number relations imply equations, equations define computable relations, computable relations define all computations, all computations include algorithmically generated observers, and these observers experience apparent physical realities. This essay is a summary of Resch's essay on the question. The link to it is in my video's description. All quotes and references come from his essay, so if you wish to dig deeper, please refer to his essay which is quite thoroughly hyperlinked to all his sources. What I am offering is something more concise. His entire text, which he made a video of, takes about four hours. Already his work is rather brief considering how much ground he is covering though I have crunched it down to less than 30 minutes, reducing his fascinating tapestry of relevant and interesting threads to just the main one of the metaphysics he is offering. Nothing. What does nothing mean? Just by removing things until nothing is left does not leave us with pure nothingness but merely a vacuum. Nothingness is not just a vacuum since in a vacuum, there is still time and space. There are still laws of nature, such as gravity. Virtual particles can still pop in and out of existence through quantum fluctuations. The universe is already in existence when we have such a vacuum, writes physicist John Archibald Wheeler. A pure nothingness will not only have no matter, there will not even be time, space, laws, and information in it. How can something come from nothing? A presupposition which has been with us since antiquity is that nothing can come from nothing. Nothingness is not productive. It is unable to produce anything. If that is the case, that means matter must first be in existence and this matter must either always have been in existence or must arise somehow. If it has always been existent, from that originary matter can then come everything else that we see around us. So to have something may be more fundamental than to have nothing. Even if that is the case, it still does not explain why something exists. What is the cause of that thing? Even when we explain the existence of things, 
be it through quantum fluctuations causing virtual particles to come in and out of existence in a vacuum, or a Big Bang event, it does not tell us why such an event happened. What we have is an explanation, a description of what has happened, a story, a history, which even if true, does not tell us the cause, it does not give us a reason. Logic Is there anything that holds true even if there is no universe in existence for them to be true in, even if there were no conscious beings to realize their truth? If they exist, such truths must be necessarily true. What are some examples of necessary truths? One set of truths that is necessary and the most fundamental is logical truths, which contains the principle of identity and the principle of non-contradiction. The principle of identity is so basic that it might be difficult to grasp. It states that a thing is identical to itself. It is a tautology, like I am me. More generally, A equals A. An instantiation of this principle in mathematics is the numerical relation, 1 equals 1. 1 is not equal to 0, 2, or any other number than itself. The principle of identity is self-evident. There is no way to prove it and it has to be true for other proofs to be obtained. It can perhaps be best understood through the consequences of what would happen if it was not true. If, for instance, 0 equals 1, it means that from nothing, something can arise. If that is the case, then something such as matter can arise from nothing. For a state of nothingness to exist and to remain in that state, the principle of identity is required. To have no laws whatsoever will be incompatible with there being and remaining no things. Another fundamental principle of logic is the principle of non-contradiction, which states that a proposition cannot be both true and false at the same time. We may be able to imagine another universe where the laws of physics are different such that the life forms there have a completely different biology from us or that gravity works differently, but even in that universe, the laws of logic, such as the principle of identity and the principle of non-contradiction, will still have to hold. These truths are truly universal. From these universal laws, we can derive other laws such as mathematical laws, numbers, and numerical relations. Such laws are a priori, where no empirical observations are required to obtain them. One such derivation is how we can arrive at numbers, even when there is nothing. In the state of nothingness, there exist zero things. Even in the state of nothingness, the abstract concept of zero exists. From zero arises all other numbers since there is at least one abstract thing to count. One along with zero makes for two abstract objects and the number two. 2 along with 1 and 0 now makes 3 abstract objects and hence the number 3. Such derivations can be extended to give the set of all numbers. This is how numbers are derived in set theory. Even with nothingness, we can obtain mathematical laws and theories such as set theory. Diophantin equations. How do we however get from these universal laws, which can be broadly called mathematics, to consciousness, and concrete matter. These are three modes of existence, the mathematical, the material and the mental. Resch's metaphysics argues that the mathematical is the most fundamental. It gives rise to mind which then gives rise to matter. We have already seen how numbers can arise from nothingness and logic, which then gives rise to mathematics. To get from how mathematics then gives rise to consciousness, we need Diophantin equations and the concept of computation or algorithms. 
The Offenten equations are equations which only involve the arithmetic operations of sums, products, and powers, where the constants and variables are integers and where the solutions of interest are also only integers. Examples include linear equations like x plus y equals 2, quadratic equations like x squared plus y equals 9 and polynomial equations like 2x cubed plus y to the power of 5 plus z squared equals 0. Such equations can have one solutions, several solutions, or no solutions. The MRDP theorem, named after the initials of its authors, showed that for any imaginable computer program, there is a Diophantin equation whose solutions equal all the outputs of that program. What is computable is any deterministic system, that is, any system which has laws which govern outcomes in a deterministic way. Hence what is computable are Diophantin equations that do have solutions. According to the Church-Turing thesis, the behavior of any finite machine can be perfectly replicated by an appropriately programmed computer. Such systems can be expressed by mathematical equations, specifically Diophantin equations which are interesting to us since they can then be implemented as computer programs. One such program is a computer program that runs all other computer programs. Corresponding to such a universal program is a universal Diophantin equation that includes all other Diophantin equations, according to the MRDP theorem. This equation is therefore a general-purpose computer. As a general-purpose computer, this equation will cover everything computable. By filling in the equation's variables systematically, all possible programs can be generated and executed with all their steps and intermediate outputs captured. These steps and intermediate outputs are their computational histories. This is particularly useful for simulations, including the simulation of all possible realities and mental states, if the mind is computational. Computational Theory of Mind According to the computational theory of mind, the mind is an information processing system, with cognition and consciousness being a type of computation. Computations can be represented by algorithms, that is, programs which can be implemented in a computer or through the neural systems in a brain. Hence each mind can be represented by a Diophantin equation. The universal Diophantin equation will include these specific Diophantin equations representing individual minds. Hence conscious beings can be found among the computational histories of the universal Diophantin equation. In addition, the historical development of the observable universe, which is finite, can also be represented by a Diophantin equation, which can then be implemented through a computer program to solve it, according to the Church-Turing thesis. When this program is run, it will contain versions of everything in the universe, including conscious beings. Its computational outputs will be identical to the state of the universe as it develops over time. The conscious beings in it will seem as conscious as the conscious beings in our world. The real world and the simulated world in that computer will be indistinguishable. The beings in the simulated world will be as convinced as the beings in the real world of the concreteness and reality of their world. When they interact with objects in their world, they experience the same response as their counterparts in the real world. Hence the objects in the simulated world will appear concrete and real to the simulated beings. Algorithmic Information Theory Contrary to the common perception of minds creating maths and matter being the substance forming minds, Resch's metaphysics explains how mind comes from maths and from mind comes the perception of material realities. 
One evidence for his theory is that not all programs will appear with equal frequency, leading to a bias in the computational history. We can then check for this bias by comparing our observations of the character of physical law and the properties of our universe against the predictions made by the theory, he writes. Not all programs occur with equal frequency as a consequence of the algorithmic information theory. The output of a program is data or information. Information can be represented in binary form. Within the many sets of information resulting from the outputs of many sub-programs of the universal Diophantin equation, we will find strings of information that are identical within and between sub-programs. The longer the string, the less likely it will occur. The shorter the string, the more frequently it will be found. For instance, the output of one program is 10100010010010010010010. The string 1010 is a 4 bit string which will occur once every 2 to the power of 4, equal 16 bit string in a random series. A 3-bit string, such as 101, will occur twice more frequently, once every 2 cube, equals 8, bit string. The program of the simulation of the universe will obey this rule of the algorithmic information theory. If the simulation of the universe resembles the real universe, we will observe this rule of algorithmic information theory to likewise apply in the real world. In the simulation, the more frequently a string occurs, that is, the more persistent these regularities are, the more they resemble laws within the simulation. The shorter the strings, the more frequently they appear, according to the algorithmic information theory. Hence short strings are like laws within the simulation. The corresponding resemblance will be laws of nature in the real world. The laws of nature, that is, the laws of physics, tend to be simple in the sense that they generalize complex phenomena with much less symbols and operations than the information describing the phenomena. The laws also tend to be mathematical. Why mathematics should be able to describe physical phenomena is surprising. Why should physics, which is the science describing physical phenomena, be mathematical? It suggests that the underlying structures of phenomena to be mathematical, which is consistent with the idea that Diophantin equations underlie reality. Or Kerm's razor. In scientific practice, simpler theories and laws are considered better than complicated ones but why? Why should the laws of parsimony or or Kerm's razor prevail? After all, the phenomena described by science are not simple. There are also more ways for the laws to be complex rather than simple. Deep truths of nature can be expressed by short formulas, like F equals M, A and E equals MC squared. Physical equations rarely involve more than a few terms rather than dozens or hundreds, Resch observes. Algorithmic information theory tells us that shorter strings occur exponentially more often than longer ones. Hence the occurrence of outputs corresponding to these shorter strings will be more frequently observed. The frequent observations lead them to be considered laws which occur with high probability and these laws are simple because they are short strings of information. A universe fine-tuned for life. Why does the universe appear fine-tuned for life? The anthropic principle states that for any universe to be perceived, it needs to contain conscious observers. The vast if not infinite possible computational histories of the universal Diophantin equation means that some of these universes corresponding to these histories will support life, though most will be dead. 
Adding in the implication of the algorithmic information theory, these life-supporting universes will be governed by simple physical laws. Quantum Mechanics Quantum mechanics suggests the existence of many parallel histories, many worlds where the infinite set of possibilities collapse to one upon observation. In this way, quantum mechanics is an expression of the universal Diophantin equation. For instance in the case of Schrödinger's cat, it is not known if the cat is alive or dead while the box is closed, that is, it has two possible solutions. But once an observer looks into the box, the two possible solutions collapse to give just one solution. Hence, there might be many possible parallel universes with the different possibilities expressed by the universal Diophantin equation when it has multiple solutions, but once a consciousness observes it, the many possibilities collapse to one and only one possible universe persist. When this collapse happens, it is unpredictable which possibility would be selected, giving us a sense of randomness in the outcome. We are unable to predict if Schrödinger's cat is dead or alive while it is in the box and unobserved. Because of the many compatible computational histories arising from the universal Diophantin equation, there are many possible outcomes but when measured or observed, one is chosen. While the equations of quantum mechanics are deterministic, which outcome occurs is unpredictable since there are many possibilities which collapse upon observation by a conscious being. Every possible program is running but when a conscious being observes or experiences the universe, reality is forced to select the laws and history that that being observes. Quantum mechanics is a physical phenomenon. Its peculiarities correspond to the mathematics of Diophantin equations, which is evidence for Resch's mathematical metaphysics. Information conservation of mass and conservation of energy in Newtonian physics, and the equivalence of mass and energy in general relativity are well-established laws of physics. Conservation of information is an outcome of quantum mechanics. Hence there is a mass-energy information equivalence. If we understand that information is fundamental, then the conclusion Resch makes that mathematics is the fundamental mode of existence is not so surprising. As Wheeler asserts, everything is information. Resch did not mention this but if everything is informational, then the existence of possible worlds, since it is not made from actual matter, has no conservation of mass and energy implications. We need not account for where the mass and energy comes from, to cause possible worlds to spring up, since it is all informational. In fact, it seems to be the only way possible worlds can arise just from there being a possibility of them. The Big Bang Our universe's history can be understood or is equivalent to the solving of the universal Diophantin equation. This history unfolds over time the same way the solving of an equation takes place in steps. As history advances, complexity increases. We can calculate backwards the universal Diophantin equation to the beginning of time and as we do that, there is increasing simplicity and compactness with entropy and algorithmic complexity decreasing until we reach an initial state of the computation at which point the backward calculation stops working or we encounter increasing complexity backwards from that point. That initial state is the Big Bang which then triggered off cosmic inflation. This cosmic inflation is equivalent to the progressive solving of the universal Diophantin equation. Conclusion We live within the total set of all computations, Resch writes. The necessity of logical laws even in a state of nothingness gives rise to numbers, leading to mathematical laws which are hence likewise necessary. 
Diophantin equations can encapsulate any algorithmic system including the mind, if the mind is computational, and the universe, if the laws governing the universe are deterministic. There exists a universal Diophantin equation capturing all other possible Diophantin equations. The solution of the universal Diophantin equation gives us infinite computational histories. This multitude of computational histories together with the consequences of the algorithmic information theory predicts a universe of inviolable, but simple, mathematical, and life-friendly laws. It predicts a multiverse of parallel histories, infinite computational complexity and a fundamental unpredictability, as we find in quantum mechanics, when a conscious observer measures and experiences the universe, causing the multiple possibilities to collapse into one in an unpredictable way. The theory predicts a universe that evolves in time, has simple initial conditions, and a point that we cannot retrodict beyond, a beginning such as the Big Bang. To me, Resch's metaphysics, which he obtains by synthesizing the leading scientific theories with philosophical theories, makes for a rather convincing account, at least in its broad strokes. I am the philosophical bachelor and not a scientist while Resch is a computer scientist and not a philosopher. Yet he manages to engage with a wide range of philosophers from ancient to contemporary thinkers to lay the ground for him to introduce contemporary scientific and mathematical theories, to attempt to answer a fundamental metaphysical question. Beyond the sections dealing with the nature of nothingness and logic, I have not focused on his more lengthy philosophical exposition since it was familiar ground. I was more interested in his scientific explanations. I hope my selection has been enough and not too little or too much, the way Einstein is thought to have said that everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler. What do you think of Resch's answer to why there is something rather than nothing? Please let us know in the comments. If you wish to support the Philosophical Channel, you can do so at worldwideweb.patreon.com slash philosophical bachelor. I have recently added another avenue for one-off contributions at gogetfunding.com slash philosophical dash bachelor. Any support is appreciated. Thank you.